Hello everybody, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, uh, services, information resources and so on for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I'm talking uh, medical education, medical communications, and digital publishing and so on. Uh, specifically, uh, one of the things is we, we do is we, um, we talk about medcoms for people who would like to join the business, and there's a resource at first, medcomsjobs.com, uh, which is full of interesting insights, videos, career guides, and so on. Um, and we run regular meetings like this, when people can find out more about the business and the individual agencies that we serve. So today, I'm absolutely delighted that we are joined by the team from Open Health, um, and we're going to hear more about what Medcoms means to them and how it works in their company. We're going to have a presentation followed by Q&A. So um, on that note, can I hand over to Rob? Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Now I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so Peter, if you can just confirm you can see that yeah excellent okay well uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you thank you to Peter for the invitation to speak to you all this afternoon and thank you to you all for joining um, so I'm Rob Pilbrow I'm global managing director of medical writing at open health and I'm joined by two colleagues so Bella Santa Cruz who's a senior account director and Imogen Allred who's a medical writer and we're going to talk to you today um, about open health. So in the time we've got, we're hopefully going to give you a, a brief introduction to who we are, uh, what we do, um, our approach as well. But uh, something that I hope will come through really strongly is our focus on culture and values as well. And so just in terms of who we are, open health, if you don't know us already, um, we're a family of expert practices and we work in partnership to drive positive change in healthcare communications and market access. So as a group, we were founded in 2011 and uh, collaboration and connectivity were two of the founding principles of the organization. And I think they continue to drive who we are and what we do to this day. Um, and as I say, founded in 2011, over the years, we've consolidated into three broad practices. Um, and these three key practices offer expertise and insight across the medical affairs space. So we have our medical communications group uh, with a focus on things like medical education, publication planning, and learning and development. Um, we have our patient and brand communications team, which looks at PR, advertising, and has expertise in patient engagement as well and our value informatics and evidence group um, which has recently been joined by Pharmaris as well to really look at things like health economics outcomes research uh, real world evidence and market access as well and we're a truly global organization so we've got more than 700 experts across 14 offices um, across six countries and um, really we have a very broad therapeutic uh, range of projects and, and areas that we work in uh, but I'd say we probably have we do have particular expertise in areas such as oncology specialized medicine and rare diseases as well so that's who we are but what is it that drives us what gets us out of bed in the morning well our vision is to be the most respected healthcare agency group on the planet so for us it's it's not about being the biggest but it's about being responsible and um, it's about being trusted and it's about being respected by our clients and colleagues alike. And so with this in mind, we use this driving ethos really to help us attract the brightest and, and most uh, enthusiastic and motivated and ambitious individuals who share our culture and values. Um, we give them ownership of their, of their projects and of their, um, their accounts and the areas they work in to really help them drive that and add value for our clients. And we aim to be leaders in the space that we operate in. So leaders in the field of areas such as medical affairs and publication planning, digital and many other areas as well. And what I should say as well is that obviously I spoke about the three practices um, in my previous slide, but obviously this is first Medcom's job. So I'm going to be focusing primarily on the medical communications practice today. But if the other practices are of interest, then of course, get in contact using the details I'm going to share at the end. So we talk a lot about what's at the heart of open health um, in our company. And uh, we share this mantra, which I think is a really useful guiding statement as to, to what we do, how we do it, and what we're trying to achieve. 
So the open health mantra is to employ and retain great people, do brilliant work, excite and delight our clients, have fun and make money. And it's always in that order. And I think to help us kind of on that path day to day, then we, we really look to our values as well. And these are values that we all put together as a group, as an organization. And you can see those at the, at the bottom of this slide here. So ownership, this is the ownership of our projects to make sure that we're, we're fully invested and we're, we're driving for the best outcomes. Partnership, the partnership that we're trying to achieve with our clients, again, to, to really do the best that we can for our clients and ultimately patients. Excellence, well, that's, that's the high standards that we, we hold ourselves to and we hold our colleagues to. And then non-conformity, I really like, because it speaks to our, our approach to, to look beyond the obvious, to really find innovative solutions and challenge convention. So far be it from me to just say all these things about open health. We've, we've really looked to our people as well to ask them what makes open health medical communication such a brilliant place to work. And you can see their responses here. But I think really the difference between a great agency and a truly brilliant agency is the people. It's the people that make that difference. And yes, we have had industry leading growth for the last five years, but beyond the financial success, it's really about creating a sustainable environment where people come to collaborate and work together and really create excellent work. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm delighted uh, to say that we're a, a finalist in the Communique Awards for uh, tomorrow evening, and we're eagerly looking forward to the results, as I'm sure many others in our industry are. Um, and also we've got, um, I just thought I'd share a couple of um, testimonials, I guess, or comments from some of our colleagues, which again, to me, really bring to life what it is, what life is like at Open Health. You know, the idea of our values bouncing off the walls when we're in brainstorms, but different opinions and different thinking being welcomed and encouraged. And also the, 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 the collaboration and the sense of being valued and your opinion being worthwhile at Open Health as well. I think that that balance between freedom and senior level support is really important to us. So outside of work, what's, or outside of projects, I guess, what's life like at Open Health? Well, um, I think it's, you know, we measure our success, not just in financial terms, but also by the sustainability of our impact on our people, on our communities and on the world. And so we have a real focus internally and have regular and active conversations about well-being and um, with a focus on areas such as mental health um, our social lives and fitness as well. And really importantly to everyone at Open Health, we have a really strong and really active corporate social responsibility group um, where we help out with local organisations uh, that really mean something to us and something in our teams. And you can see there just an illustration of the, the number of hours that have been donated, both in terms of kind of availability to volunteer for local causes and also the financial commitments as well that we've made to this. And then finally, I just want to, to in this, the final part of this introduction is really just talking about um, our people again. And we are entirely dependent on our people. It's our people that drive our success. And that's why we, we really want to attract the brightest, the most enthusiastic, uh, the most ambitious and the most motivated people to join our team. And in return, we offer a, a diverse, inclusive, collaborative and inspirational environment really for everyone to do their best work. And this is really encapsulated in our, our um, campaign of how far do you want to go? And really the premise behind this is that you can create your own career path at Open Health and the only limitation is your ambition. So you can come in and have a really, a real conversation with someone who understands um, where you want to go, what you want to focus on. They understand that that might change after some, some time in the industry, but you're always given that support um, to really create your own path. Um, and so, yeah, with that in mind, I think then it now's a really good point to having given that general introduction to the company and who we are and our culture and values. I think it would be great now to hear from from Imogen and Bella and also myself about our journeys to date in Medcoms and how we've kind of got to where we are um, to bring this to life. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Imogen. Hey, so um, as Rob mentioned earlier, I am a writer and not a speaker, which may explain why my slide is so populated with words rather than pictures. <laughs> and I have, I've included my more corporate picture on top of my much less corporate one, the one that I actually use on Zoom on the bottom of me feeding some alpacas just for a bit of uh, contrast. 
So what I really wanted to do was explain a little bit about my background and my sort of path into medcoms, because having spoken to other medical writing colleagues, it seems that I walked a reasonably well trodden path out of academia. So I started back in 2008, which distressingly is 12 years ago, starting my degree in biology because I loved science. I loved all sort of aspects of living science, life sciences. And so I really enjoyed my degree exploring all these different aspects of biology. And it seemed very normal to me to then move straight into a PhD because why would I not continue studying something that I loved? So I did a PhD in neuroscience. And I think what I really came to realize as I started carrying out research was that the science that I could engage with was getting more and more narrow and more and more specific. I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a hand talker, so all this hand gesturing is happening just below the camera. <laughs> um, but after my PhD, I felt that I didn't want to just throw away my education, and I thought there was a reasonable amount of pressure to stay in academia. So I went on to do postdoctoral research for several years, and I think that made it incredibly apparent to me that it wasn't right for me. What I really enjoyed was writing and communicating about science and not necessarily conducting the research itself. And perhaps more than that, um, well, I started thinking about it recently as though an academic is like a researcher standing on an iceberg. So all the science that you can interact with is just this little tip of the iceberg. And the longer that you stand on that iceberg, the more it melts in the sun and the less, you know, the smaller the area of science, the smaller your field becomes as you become more and more expert in one specific area. And really I realized what I wanted to do was to jump off this iceberg into the ocean. I wanted to see the rest of the iceberg and maybe even look at some other icebergs and perhaps look at some fish and plants and all sorts of other things. And really what I wanted to do is kind of flip this thing where I wanted to stop narrowing and instead I wanted to broaden out and engage with lots of different cutting edge science. The problem for me, you know, is once I realized that I felt quite trapped within the confines of academia and I didn't like where this path was going, I had to try to find, you know, a job that would take advantage of the education that I've poured a lot of time into, but, you know, that also would allow me to access lots of different parts of science and perhaps would allow me to write about science and communicate science. And it took me quite a few months to realize that medcoms, um, that medcoms even existed. And I will throw in a little comment that jobs are kind of like buses and I spent a long time trying to find jobs to apply for. And once I did find them in medcoms, I had a whole trough of interviews that came along all at the same time. So I was quite able to readily compare between different agencies. And of course, everyone has their own preferences for what they're looking for, but I did find that I knew as soon as I came in to open health for my interviews that the cultural fit was just so right. You know, it was very, it was a relaxed, non-corporate atmosphere. My interviewers were just very friendly. It felt like we were having a great chat about science and they were very frank and open about open health and how they dealt with clients, with their own people and the opportunities that were there. So I was, you know, by the time I was starting my job, I was feeling quite keen about it. Um, I will add a little note that I, um, I joined Open Health in late March 2020, right as the coronavirus lockdown came in. And I suppose perhaps as a testament as to how well they dealt with the whole coronavirus situation that three months in, I'm still here and happy working entirely um, virtually and remotely. Um, but I will say that, you know, before I started, I did have some reservations about moving into a job in medcoms or more specifically moving out of academia. I think there's a lot of stigma within academia to, into um, about changing careers. And this would be a good point uh, to go to the next slide, if you would, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> so I made, you know, I composed a little list um, basically of what I imagined moving out of academia into a medcoms environment might be like versus what it's actually been like for me. And, you know, I imagined it would be very, it could be very isolating, very corporate, very competitive that I might be assigned just one therapy area and I'd be in a similar situation to what I've been trying to avoid in academia where I just knew about this one specific part of science. But what I actually found was a really, you know, open, collaborative, relaxed and friendly community of people, not just the writers, you know, so the account handlers and even, you know, divisional directors and so on. You can always have a chat with anyone, um, at least over here. And I found that everything was you know, exciting. There was a lot of learning and I'm still, you know, I'm learning about lots of different things all the time. And it's just been 
a really fantastic experience and honestly I don't really know what I was um, so worried about and just to provide some context for this little photo that I put in at the bottom this is just a screenshot from our um, weekly medical writers meeting you can get extra points if you can work out which of these pictures is me um, if you look for the requisite amount of a uh, kitchen equipment that's on my head you might uh, you might spot me <laughs> but with that I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Bella who will talk about the account handling side of things Thanks Imogen. Um, so very much like Imogen, I just thought I'd take you through kind of my journey and how I ended up in, in Medcoms and on the account handler side, because um, I'm, I'm currently a senior account director. Um, so I guess it takes me back to doing my undergraduate degree, which was in neuroscience. And um, in hindsight, um, I think I probably knew what medical communications was. I just didn't know there was a name for it and I didn't know it was an industry. So I was coming towards the end of my degree and I thought, right, well, obviously I, I need to get a job, but I have no idea what I want to do. All I knew at that point was that I was passionate about healthcare and medicine and that I didn't want to be in a lab. So um, I took a trip to the careers office and I, you know, I sat down and I explained and I was actually working on a science communications project um, as part of my final year. So I kind of, you know, explained that and said how much I enjoyed it. Um, and the, at the careers office at the time, they kind of said to me, oh, well, that's lovely, but that's not a job. That's, that's not an industry. Um, you know, here's some suggestions. And I, I got the, um, the big pharma kind of grad schemes and some other suggestions, but very much um, at least then there was no uh, awareness of, of the industry. Um, so then I came along and I graduated. And um, despite knowing that I was passionate about healthcare, um, the kind of onus and pressure to get a job um, was really kind of the, the uh, looming thing at the time. So uh, ironically enough, I ended up getting my first job in estate management, so uh, in property, uh, which is of course nothing to do with healthcare. Um, but you know, at that time I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I just thought I need a job. So um, at that point I, I get my job and I thought, right, I've ticked that off, done that. And what I discovered really, really quickly um, was that what I really wanted um, out of a job was variety. Um, my job then was very, uh, every day was very similar um, and I, I found it very boring and I miss that kind of excitement of um, doing different things every day and every week having a kind of different flavor to it. And, and actually, ironically enough, I remember having a conversation with my mum after I'd been working there for a while and said, I, I understand now why everyone hates work. Like, I, I totally get it now. Um, but luckily for me, um, I had a call from a, someone that I was at university with out of the blue. And she said, hey, Bella, do you remember that science communications project we did? So I was like, yeah, of course, loved it. Um, she's like, well, I've got a job. I think you'll really love it. Um, so she introduced me to Medcoms um, and I, you know, came into the career that way. So very much by accident. Um, and actually the proactivity of a friend rather even than myself. So um, definitely grateful to her to this day and, and she's also still in the industry. Sorry, Bella, we're losing you there, Bella. Sorry, I'm going to cut in here. Sorry, Bella, I'm not sure if you can hear us even when we're losing you. I presume it's not me. Rob, can you pick up on this from there? Yeah, yeah, likewise, I'm, I'm picking up on that too. So. Um, Unfortunately, I think we've lost Bella. So I'm going to just move on to her next slide um, in which we just cover off the important skills for an account executive. So um, as Bella was talking about, she um, when she'd, she'd found this role in open health, she joined and she said, I believe she's been with the company for more than five years now on the account handling side. And I think these are some of the skills um, that she's identified. And I totally agree with that. I think are really important for someone who's looking to get into the account handling side of the business. Um, they've got to be a good communicator and a good listener. Absolutely, you've got to have great people skills because I think building relationships, as Bella touched on, is one of the most important parts of the of our industry and, and of that role in particular. Um, somebody who's very organised, has a very systematic approach, good project management skills, adaptable problem solving attitude, um, and really a motivated go getter and, and kind of solution finder. I think. I think we, if you're in the industry, you can probably recognize a lot of these traits as being really important to what we do. And I'd say many of these are shared on the medical writing side as well, um, with just probably that additional 
um, requirement to have a, a strong understanding of, uh, of, of, the scientific, of science and uh, that scientific background and obviously ability to write well as well. Um, and de definitely attention to detail is a really important skill um, for both roles. So uh, welcome back, Bella. And, Hi, um, can I, can, just checking if I'm back online, you can hear me okay? We can, yeah, yeah, all good. So I was just okay. covering off the uh, important skills and then uh, it's back to me now actually for, for my um, kind of potted history. So um, I grew up in Chester and so I was born in Chester and I, was, I stayed there till I went off to university and I went to university quite a long time ago now unfortunately um, but I went to Birmingham where I did a BSc in biochemistry and then having really enjoyed my third year research project I then stuck around to do a research master's, an MPhil in molecular and cellular biology. And I, I enjoyed that master's, but it taught me a couple of things. And one of those was that I really did not want to go on and do a PhD at the end of it. Um, I'd really enjoyed learning about science, communicating science, um, synthesizing information from lots of different sources, really getting under the skin of a, a scientific issue or a, an unmet clinical need. But it was just actually being in the lab for 12 hours a day that I found very solitary, quite frustrating, and I knew that I didn't want to be involved in actually conducting research myself. So as Imogen and Bella have, have talked about with their stories, I, I looked around and very fortunately I came across medical writing. Now this was before, Peter, I believe this was before Medcom's networking even, even existed and there was far less information out there about, about medical communications and the industry that we all work in, but I was lucky that I spoke to a couple of well-informed people and was pointed in the right direction by a careers advisor at my university. And to cut a long story short, I started as an associate medical writer in 2005 uh, with a very small agency in Reading. And then over the next 14 years, I stayed with that agency. Um, I saw fantastic growth. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I learned a huge amount. Um, and I also went back to university in um, 2010 to do a part-time master's in health economics and health policy and I think this is just quite a nice illustration of the the lifelong learning that you can actually get in a career in medical communications so I was very lucky to be supported by my employers um, but I went back and completed this part-time master's while working full-time which I will say was incredibly tough and I would never do that again um, but I came out of it with with another qualification and a really good understanding of um, some of the most important uh, topics and issues um, affecting healthcare today. And then to complete the story, I joined Open Health uh, just over a year ago and uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying um, life there as well. Um, so, as this is a, a webinar for those who are looking to break into the industry who have an interest in a first Medcoms job, I really wanted to talk about training at Open Health in the last couple of slides that we have of our presentation because I know this is hugely important to anyone who's looking to join the industry. There's a very steep learning curve when you join Medcoms, but at Open Health, we really believe in supporting people um, through that learning curve and really encouraging them and providing all the resources and support they need to, to accelerate their learning. And so we've got a number of different approaches from internal learning, from learning from all of the experts we have within the company, and um, through regular structured comprehensive induction and development programs. We have technical training for all of our teams I'm going to focus on the technical training that we have for the medical writing team in the next slide. Um, we also have soft skills, so supporting people um, with those. So if you're interested in things like facilitation or uh, moderation or coaching, then we have really high quality resources to support you with that. Um, where appropriate and when necessary, we bring in external expertise to train us on various topics. Here are just a few examples of topics that we've, we've had external um, training on in the last year or so. And then, of course, on the job training is really important for anyone who's uh, joining the industry afresh. And we're really committed to things such as mentoring from your manager and making sure time is set aside for that to then senior review for a writer, for example. So getting feed, detailed feedback on your writing that really helps to improve uh, your work. And I think just as an indication of, of how committed we are to training, um, we, we delivered more than three and a half or almost three and a half thousand hours of training last year just for in the open health communi medical communications team. So it really is an important part of our work and everyone who joins the company is fully supported in their, their training and development. And I touched upon um, training for, for medical writers and I just wanted to share with you our open writing training programme. 
um, which um, I helped to um, develop along with a number of others in the organization um, after joining. Um, so at Open Health, we've always had a really good background in training our staff and have really strong internal trainers and expertise, but we hadn't perhaps pulled together a robust, comprehensive, structured training program that was run centrally. So that was something that we, we delivered, uh, sorry, developed and delivered when I joined. And uh, after about six months of planning, we were all ready to launch this in April 20, uh, 2020 as a live training program. But then, as, uh, as I'm sure we've all had to do over the last couple of months, um, we've had to adjust and kind of react to the COVID situation. And so um, in, in a matter of weeks, we had to then change that from a fully face-to-face -face training program to fully digital. And the great thing was that we were able to use all of the systems and all the platforms that we regularly use for internal communication, but also on our project work to then do that really effectively. And something that I was really proud to see at the end of the training was that um, we surveyed all of the participants, all of the 16 participants, with regard to their confidence with medical writer competencies, both before and after the training. And we saw a huge increase in their, their confidence. Um, and they were 91% uh, was the average um, figure for their confidence with their core competencies, which for me really illustrates the impact of a program like this and, and what a uh, what strong robust program that we have for entry-level medical writers joining uh, the industry. But um, I'd really like you to hear from Imogen as well, because Imogen was one of those 16 writers who went through the program. So Imogen is just going to share her thoughts on open writing as well. Hello again. So again, this is quite a text heavy slide, but I'll try to keep it brief to make sure we have plenty of time for any Q&A that people might have. So obviously for me coming into Medcoms, it was a slightly strange experience because a lot of the elements are very familiar, the science, the experiment, the communication, while other parts, the context within which that all happened was quite unfamiliar, particularly, you know, the clinical trials and the pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I found, you know, people come into, at least well, people came into open writing with a wealth of different backgrounds and experience. But for me personally, um, I found that it really helped place all of the work into the context of the pharma industry. And it gave me a lot of knowledge and understanding that I didn't have before about how to produce writing for various different specific clients and audiences. And perhaps really the key thing is that it helped me not to think, you know, not to think about just how we write things, but also why we write things and what the end goal is. So overall, it was it was really amazing. It was an amazing course to have right at the start of joining, just to put everything into place, so that I had confidence going forward in a slightly adjusted way of communicating science. Great, thank you, Imogen. So with that, we're going to wrap up the, the formal presentation, and uh, we'd love to take some questions um, from the audience and, and from Peter. Um, but what I would say is that if uh, if you like what you've heard, if you've listen to us speak about open health and hopefully really picked up on our passion for the, the company and our culture and our values and how strong they are and how they're at the forefront of everything we do, then please get in touch. Um, we really encourage people to get in touch with our talent team for an open conversation about your background, about what it is you want to achieve. Um, and then please do check out our, our live roles as well, because all of our open uh, positions are available on our, on our careers page as well. And of course, myself, Imogen and Bella are very happy for anyone to get in contact with us directly over LinkedIn or, or by email as well. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone very much for their uh, attention and their interest. And I'll stop the presentation and we can take some questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much. OK, cheers. That was very comprehensive. Um, let's, let's just face up to the fact we're, we're sitting here in June and we're still in lockdown. And, and you've been talking about the corona effect and, and the online training and all the rest of it. So. Um, you know that that's an interesting context to, to the conversation yeah but but maybe I can can I just start with um, well let me just start by saying to the audience that's here uh, please do send in your comments and questions we've got a number coming in um, so just a quick reminder at the bottom of your screen you have a chat button and a Q&A button um, either of those pulls up text boxes so just text in your questions and we'll pick up on those over the next 10-15 minutes or so and um, just um, what I was going to say was maybe Imogen and then Bella can I go in that order um, just just give us a sense at the moment, um, you know, what, what, what's your day-to-day -day work like? And as I say, in the context of we're all in lockdown anyway, so I guess you're all sitting there at home. Uh, just give us a sense of what you're doing and how it's working on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, so I obviously started remotely. So in a way, I don't have the comparator to what it would mm. be like going into an office every day. But I would say, you know, 
open health generally have given me quite a lot of flexibility over how I control my time and I can really structure my day in a way that suits me around various obligations and many people have around obligations that they've had at home. But probably the key thing, and I suspect Bella may echo this, is that there's a lot of variety every day. So I get to work on a massive range of projects, a massive range of therapy areas. You know, so there's a lot of writing involved. There's, you know, working on manuscripts and presentations and things like that. But there's also a lot of strategic thinking. So I've been able to help out in publications, plannings. I've sat in and listened to advisory boards and generated reports based on those. And I think even just in three months, I've taken part in so many different projects that I'm always sort of excited to see what new thing might, uh, might come in next. Excellent. And, and Bella, what about you? Yeah, I think um, exactly as Imogen said, um, every day is different, um, but for sure, um, some things that you can kind of guarantee on the account handling side is um, that your day will involve kind of talking to your clients, giving them updates on projects, um, having updates with the team and thinking about uh, where projects are internally, who do you need to speak to, do you need to coordinate between the studio team and the digital team. And in the account handler role, um, it's very much about organization, so tracking things and, and working with different groups of people towards, uh, I guess, the, the same goal. Um, the obvious thing at the moment is, of course, when uh, this all did happen with the lockdown is we've had a huge effort to convert a lot of our face-to-face -face activities and congresses into virtual formats. Um, so ordinarily, if you'd asked me a year ago, I, said, I would have said, we're traveling, you're going to congresses, you're going to meetings, and that's all changed now. And one of the things that has been, I guess, enjoyable about it is um, it's all right having a one hour webinar to kind of catch up on small things. But if you were planning on doing a two day educational meeting with 200 healthcare professionals, well, how are we going to deliver that now? Because no one's going to sit on a Zoom call for two days um, and, and be able to absorb anything. So very much looking at digital and other ways that we can deliver education, um, which has been nice because it's given us an opportunity to step back and think about, well, we normally did things like this, but now we can't, um, and really opening the floor for like really new ideas and ways of doing things. So um, a lot of brainstorming and proposals for clients as well, that would definitely form part of your day. Excellent. Okay, thanks. And, and sorry, I think we probably should just acknowledge we're having a little bit of the problems with um, sound and video from Bella, sorry. Um, and you might not be aware of it, Bella. So um, no problem. I just wanted to acknowledge the fact if anyone's watching this later on, that that's what's happening. Um, so that's great. Um, let, let's, we have actually got quite a few questions coming in and they're coming in by email as well, which um, has slightly taken me by surprise. Um, okay, so um, let's just start at the beginning. And, 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 we've, and the nice thing about this, we've got account management and, and medical writing represented and there are differences you know maybe we can compare and contrast a little bit um we've got a number of questions coming in about qualifications um mm -hmm. which we never to get with these sorts of conversations um you know somebody's emailed in about you know if i've got a bsc uh, can i get in basically do i need phds do i need postdocs and a number of these questions are asking the same sort of questions um, can we just touch on that a little bit more, Rob, from your point of view, um, mm. and draw the distinction perhaps between the, the account management and the medical writing side, which I think would probably have a slightly different answer. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've always, I think throughout my career, I've always had a really clear view on this, actually, because it is, you're right, it's a question that comes up all the time. Do I, have, do I need to have a PhD to become a medical writer? And my, my thought throughout my career has always been, it's not essential but it does add value. It's a nice, you know, it's a nice thing to have. And I'll explain the reason behind that. So it's not essential because, well, I don't have one. So I don't have a PhD and I'll explain the reasons for that at the start that I, I could have gone on to do a PhD, but there are a number of reasons why I chose not to. And for many people, it is a personal choice. It's not that they're not capable of doing a PhD, but they, they might want to go and work in a more commercial environment. They may not enjoy elements of academia. Um, so yeah for me it's not an essential and it's certainly not at open health for a medical writer having said that obviously doing any kind of postgraduate qualification like a master's or a phd is a valuable endeavor and it gives you a number of transferable skills many of which are directly relevant to the world of medical communications and medical writing um, and so yeah for anyone who's done a phd they will have spent many hours um, having to digest literature and practice critical appraisal, 
communicate the results of their research to lots of different audiences, be it their family, be it their professor, their um, supervisor, and their peers in the pub. Um, and so it's, you know, there's a number of different audiences. You get used to um, developing posters and presentations. You may write a manuscript. You might write up your research and get familiar with the publication process. So, yeah, of course, there are lots of transferable skills that you get from a postgraduate qualification, which do directly lend themselves to medical writing. But no, it's not essential. And I know plenty of excellent medical writers who do not have a PhD or perhaps don't even have a postgraduate qualification. They've just got their, their graduate degree. And specifically with your writing, pro your open writing programme. So mm -hmm. there are no basic constrictions there. You're looking for the right people rather than a certain set of qualifications. Yeah, so I would say that a, a, a degree in life sciences is certainly right, okay. important because, um, and the reason for that is because we are working with complex concepts, you know, molecular pathways, signaling pathways, oncological pathways, um, immuno-oncology, you know, the spe in specialised medicine and in oncology and rare diseases, the, the language we use and the concepts we talk about are, are intricately linked to, to kind of basic concepts of biomedicine so you need to have that background to come in and be able to work with that that knowledge day to day um i'm sure there are med i know there are medical writers out there who perhaps have come in through a different route historically and don't actually have a background and they do an excellent job but i'd say if we were looking for someone to join us we would be looking for as a medical writer we'd be looking for a a graduate degree in the life sciences um topic as a minimum Okay, and just to follow the writing side for a moment, because we have had another couple of questions coming on this one. If you're, um, again, it's a common question, if you're a non-native English speaker, mm. yeah. uh, are there different, uh, you know, can they get in? Can they come in as a writer? What are the challenges for them? What are you looking for then? Are there, uh, do you see, again, I'm, I'm trying not to put words in your mouth, sorry, so I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, to answer the question up front, we have several non-native English speaking uh, writers within our team at all levels um, from entry level to very experienced writers and they do an excellent job and I think it's um, the requirement really is obvious we do work in English that is the, the language that we use for the vast majority of our projects so that is an essential requirement really to the ability to write clearly concisely and effectively um, to a high standard understanding um, sentence structure grammatical requirements and so on so um, if someone can demonstrate that through our writing tests and through the interview process, then absolutely, that'd be great. Excellent. And what I also add to that is, um, so now I'm putting words in your mouth, but you know, it is a global <laughs> business, so multiple absolutely. skills are very useful. Um, yeah. So that, that can, play to, you, you, it can play to your strengths there. But the English yeah. language standards have to be high, that's, that's fundamental. Um, yeah, and I think that's a great addition, and it's a good point. You know, I mentioned at the start about the global nature of our business, how we've got um, offices in six countries so absolutely yeah okay okay um just switching to the account management side because we sort of missed that one so again just just briefly can you just compare and contrast a little bit on the account management side would the story be a little bit different you're looking for more business experience perhaps project management experience rather than maybe the academic qualifications and the science i'm just trying to draw the distinction between those two sides or yeah do you say very much the same same well bella do you want to take that one yeah, sure. If I if I if you lose me, jump in, Rob. Yeah. Um. But but um. What I'd say is um. Again, I think a life sciences qualification is preferred. Um. And that's purely because uh. One myth is that account handlers just do all the kind of project management. Very much as you progress in your role, that scientific understanding, so you can have strategic conversations about the science with your clients and the healthcare professionals, is really important. And if you have that basis, and um, that will definitely help you in that. But very much, you know, it's not a deal breaker. If uh, you don't have that, and there are people in the business who don't have a life sciences degree, but that had all the other great transferable skills, and now throughout their career, they've built up that scientific understanding. That's also totally possible. Um, but yeah, just something that when on your career path, you might have to focus more on is building that, that scientific understanding. But it's um, definitely possible to come in and be very successful if you're prepared to, to, to work on it. Excellent. And I think I'm right in saying, Rob, you've talked about the open writing programme. You're, you're mm -hmm. developing an open, what are you calling it, account exec programme, yeah? Yeah, so we have, uh, 
as you correctly point out, I, you know, with my focus on medical writing, I've spoken about that today, but we have similar approaches for our other um, functions within open health and, and your know, training and development is hugely important to those roles as well. So that um, anyone joining those other functions gets a really solid grounding when they join the company. Excellent. And to ask an obvious question, um, and, and there may not be a clear answer to this, but, you know, we've just gone through three months, four months of quite a lot of disruption transition. Imogen, you've talked about the fact you've done this all remotely. Do you, I mean, do you see that opening up more opportunity to bring people in more widely in future and to onboard them remotely? Or do you think we will naturally come back to you come into the office in order to to learn how to be a medcom specialist? Do, do you have any view mm. on that? Well, yeah, I think it, it's probably... That's a question we're all asking ourselves at the moment in the industry. So out of necessity, um, people have onboarded um, fully virtually. I think Imogen is, is one of them, really. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's things that these are things that we've done out of necessity as an industry over the last three or four months due to the massive disruption that, that I think any of us saw coming six months ago. Um, whether we return to that, I, who knows? Um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, sadly. Um, but I think, you know, having shown proof of, of concept you know we've seen it happen and we've seen that it works so i definitely you know my personal view is that i think a hybrid model in future will definitely be possible whereby you know we're, we're getting the best candidates who are best suited to our our needs but also our culture and our, our values and i think geography will become less of a, a consideration yeah 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 again we don't quite know how this is going to pan out but a couple of the questions are coming in about sort of life work balance um doing the work around childcare and so on and so forth mm -hmm. um i mean again without wanting to put too many words in your mouth this is a fairly flexible um working environment anyway um yeah. covid has sort of shoved us a little bit um but i guess you, you you were already working flexibly weren't you people were able to were were people able so i should I'll, I'll turn it into a question were people able to work at home anyway um yes. and, and have we just gone further with it because of the lockdown and, and do you expect things just to keep going in that direction yeah yeah so pre-covid we had a really mature approach i think to to home working and, and and where people are located and kind of flexibility around hours of work and and location of work and again you know covid's just kind of forced everyone's hand hasn't it really in terms of uh, making that much more um of a, a thing for everyone now but it's you know it was working well before for us i think as i say we just have a a really really mature and open and flexible approach to to working um, across all of our teams, and it, you know, if people do good work and um, and work hard, then absolutely, location is yeah not as important. Yeah, I don't yeah, know, if Bella, do. you have anything to add to that from the account management side? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I just kind of echo your thoughts, and um, I, one thing I'll say that I definitely miss is um, office life in terms of mm. the the team catch ups, the um, wine trolley on a Friday small things like that but um definitely in terms of being able to manage your projects and work successfully as a team or well, we've seen that we can do it so I, I definitely see the future looking a bit different to how it was before excellent okay can I just wrap up with one final question because I've got one on the, on the time and as usual our recording is going over time here um but just to sort of wrap up we've got writer we've got account management um questions literally just come in you know how do you or can you move between the two? Just a couple of final comments on, on the opportunity to come in, maybe on the writing side and move to account management or vice versa. Um, who wants to take that? Who can, who can pick up on that? Rob, as an overview, start off. Yeah, yeah, I can start off. Yeah, so I think it's, it just speaks to that, um, that concept that I spoke about earlier about you know, managing your own career path and how far do you want to go. And I think we, we, we don't put people in boxes to open out. You know, if you come in in a particular role and then perhaps after a couple of years you realize that your your interest your your skills um lie in another role in open health and absolutely we'll have a conversation about kind of what that looks like and um i think again it's just kind of that mature conversation with um you know highly intelligent highly qualified people as to where they can best um kind of put put their skills into practice but i can think of several examples where people have come in in one particular role and then yeah either kind of changed into a different function or they've progressed from a, a technical role into more of a kind of general management role and are doing a fantastic job in that. And, and to, again, an obvious question that your international group or at least the international offices are, so is the opportunity there to move in principle in, in, to move around different countries and so on? Is that possible? 
Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, certainly, you know, given the size of the organization, I guess it just depends on business needs and, yeah. and elements such as that. But yeah, theoretically, yeah, it's uh, absolutely given the size of the organization. Okay, okay. Look, we're a little bit over. So I'm going to I'm going to call a halt to the recording part of this, if that's okay, guys. Um, huge thank you to you. Those of you online at the moment, don't all rush away because we'll carry on talking. And there are quite a few questions here. So we'll try and pick off some more of these specific questions. Okay. Um, but we'll be here to the top of the hour. Um, but thank you very much. Um, all of you, Bella, Imogen, and Rob, um, you've already said it, I'll say it again, you're very happy to hear from people uh, directly yep. via LinkedIn, that's the easy way of making contact. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, and just a general point from my point of view, anyone watching this video, you'll find lots of these sorts of videos over at Network Pharma TV um, and, and details of what we're doing over at medcomsnetworking.com. So big thanks to you guys, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now just with a little wave from everybody if that's okay, because that's the thing now, we just wave everybody and go, bye. <laughs>